Welcome everyone uh, to, I think, what will be the last seminar for this year. Uh, today we have Swap Lemay coming to visit us from uh, Dublin, and he will tell us about black holes and the TT bar deformation. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction to Jan for inviting me. Um, so this talk is based on this paper with Jan. Um, my first time in IAS, so I mean, you can see I am coming from one IAS to another. <laughs> okay. Uh, do interrupt me if you have any questions. Okay, let me. Oh. Let me uh, start by summarizing the talk. So we'll be talking about deformed black holes in n equals to two string theory. So we'll shut down the D6 brain charge. Uh, the microscopic description of such black holes is given by MSW CFT. Anderson yeah. from your region CFT, well known. Um, this arises in, if you consider the corresponding brain system, which has uh, D4, D2, and D0 brains, and then you take a certain large volume limit, which in particular involves uh, taking the volume of the Calabria to be very large, which you do by taking the Kähler modulus to be very large. Uh, in that limit, CFT is a good description of this particular system. Now, the question we pose in this uh, work is that suppose you move away from that large volume limit and you go to finite volume limit, then what might be a good description of this system? And we provide evidence that this might be captured by TT bar deformation of uh, the MSW CFT. There is a sign thing here, so I'll just mention that uh, for us, it has a positive sign, this particular uh, deformation. There is a holographic dual story of it, uh, which I think we're just beginning to scratch. Uh, in particular, it looks like that in, in this work that the corresponding holographic dual, the boundary is moving outward. I'll explain what I mean by it. Um, yeah, okay, so this is the broad contour of the work. But why is this interesting? Uh, why should one care about it? Um, what do you mean by n equals two string theory? I just meant to say n equals two, two uh, programming. So. Oh, okay. So type two? Uh, yeah, type two. Yeah. Um, okay, so largely how black hole microscopic accounting works, uh, it's like that. You have a black hole, you have the bekenstein hawking entropy, and you want to understand the microscopic origin of that entropy. Of course, uh, the root cause of the trouble is understanding quantum gravity. Now, typically, you take any microscopic description of black holes in string theory, D1, D5, CFT, MSW, CFT, whatever. One thing common in all of them is that you do not have gravity as a dynamic degree of uh, freedom. And to some extent that's, uh, I mean, since it's a field theoretic framework, we can do a lot of stuff. Uh, in, uh, in the detail is the te technicality, but I think absence of gravity is a very qualitative feature. Now, in best of the worlds, of course, you'd like to understand the microstates of a black hole directly in the black hole. Um, that's easier said than done. So perhaps more realistically, one might aim for still starting here in the D-brain description, but in some sense moving towards the black hole, that is somehow going to a regime where effects of gravity are still important and coming up with a microscopic description of that regime. That might be a, a realizable goal. And in this particular work, this is what we try to achieve for uh, this D4 ring black holes. This is the goal. Any questions? Okay. Uh, I'll just uh, I'll start with a quick introduction to D4 brain black holes. Um, I'll quickly revise the existing story and then uh, we'll talk about our work. Okay. Um, most of our work will 
essentially use very little information about uh, the deep orbit black holes. It will uh, mostly use the information about mass. So since it's a supersymmetric black hole, its uh, mass is bonded. We work in a convention where there's a factor of two pi over gs. Uh, it's a solitary state, so uh, we expect it. The central charge will be uh, will play a crucial role for how this work. So uh, let's look at it a bit more closely. The P here is the dipole brain charge, or the magnetic charge. Q is here is the D two brain charge, and Q zero is the D zero brain charge. Uh, T is the complexified scalar modulus, and the index A comes from reducing these two forms uh, over various two cycles. Uh, J is the killer form, form B is the uh, form. Uh, the entropy of such black holes are known, but it will not be very important for this particular work, so I'll not talk about it. Uh, let's look at the central charge a bit more uh, closely. We can, the point is that we can read a lot from the central charge itself, and that will be important for our work. So, um, for example, suppose you did not know that the content of this black hole is a D4, D2, and D, D0 thing. You could have read that just from the central charge. For example, look at the first term. Uh, in string theory textbook, will tell you that the, this uh, blue or uh, anyway, this color, uh, this expression is the D4 brain tension. And this is the volume of a four cycle. So this is the mass of a D4 brain wrapping a four cycle. J is the Keller form. Um, similarly, the second term is the mass of a D2 brain wrapping a two-cycle Q. Uh, last one is the uh, D0 brain of this much in number. Uh, so the central charge tells you that it's a bound state of D4, D2, and D0 brains wrapping appropriate cycles. Why is there an I in front of the circle? Um, well, you. If you compute the central charge, you get an I. Uh, you mean intuitively, why should you expect an I? Um, I would say that it's electric charge, and this one is magnetic charge. That might be one way to not draw off any better way of thinking about it. Then the Q0 is a cover man. Well, D4 brain comes with an induced D0 brain charge. So, if, uh, so the purest you can go is with some induced D0 brain charge. Uh, that will actually be important. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, you can actually write down a partition function. I means mean, that the D4 D2 system isn't supersymmetric or doesn't preserve the same supersymmetry. So the D4, D0 system can preserve it. The D0 and D4 can be mutually BPS because their central charges are aligned being both real. You have to make sure they have the same sign, but they can preserve common supersymmetries. A D4 and a parallel D2 don't preserve any supersymmetries. And the way they achieve that is that their, their, their central charges are out of phase. Okay. okay. Well, a system with both D4 and D2 can be supersymmetric, but its central charge has a different phase, but preserves different supersymmetries from what either one would preserve, preserve separately. Or together they will preserve, uh, they preserve something, okay. but not the same thing that either one would preserve separately. Whereas the D0 and D4 are aligned, so they can preserve the, the same supersymmetries. Can I move on? Uh, you can write down a partition function of uh, the black hole degeneracies. Um, again, the detail is not too much important. The important uh, bit is that you can take the central charge, you can expand it for uh, large J, and then it simplifies a lot. In particular, you can see, you can identify a tau here, and it has exactly the form of a, uh, 
of a paternalistic genus of a CFT. Um, this business is going on in supergravity, but the tau is meaningful even in the CFT. Uh, an alternative way of thinking about these quantities would be to go to type 2b, where it will become a Euclidean D3 brain. Okay, it's a side comment. Um, this will be important for us because uh, so this story is happening where we are expanding it to large uh, in large J limit and keeping terms up to order one and neglecting terms uh, like one over J square and so on. Uh, in this work, we'll try to include them. Okay. The existing picture is like this. So we have a 4D black hole, which we have talked about, the before brain black hole. You can elevate it to 5D to a 5D black string. That's one side of the story. Uh, you can go to the microscopic description where it's described by the MSW CFT. You have to take a certain limit in particular that has the effect of, uh, um, I mean, going to a regime where you can justifiably ignore the effects of gravity. Um, in the 5D geometry, asymptotically flat, you can take, you can sort of replace this limit as a decoupling limit. In effect, it's like zooming into the uh, black string. And in this limit, you recover an ATS3. Uh, holographic duality is uh, expected. The uh, rough understanding is that uh, if a black hole bounces, I mean, mm -hmm. single center black holes are, of, co of course, they go down to uh, ATS3. But in N equals to two supergravity, you also have multi center uh, black holes. Some of them in this particular limit uh, go down a single ADS3 throw. It's expected to be captured by the CFT2. Now, on top of this existing picture, the questions we uh, try to address is the are the following that we start with the CFT. Now, whatever justified the ignoring of gravity, if we remove those uh, uh, conditions, which will which amounts to taking J to be finite, I'll explain why. Uh, then how does this theory change? Correspondingly, how does this ADS3 change? And is there a duality? The questions here? Uh, let's um, start with uh, re re revising how we go from the black hole to the CFT. So first of all, to get to a CFT, get to a CFT you need an effective string. So you need a brain system which intersects in along one common spatial direction, uh, which is not the case for D2D, D4, D2, D0 brains. So you uh, go to M theory, where the D4 brain becomes an M5 brain, an extra dimensions coming from M theory, and it becomes an M5 brain. The D2 brain becomes an M2 brain, or equivalently of plus this uh, word volume of M5 brain, and D0 brains are realized as moment dial on this uh, M theory circle. Now, this system has an extent along the M theory circle, uh, if you reduce over the four cycle, which the D4 brain is to wrap, you have an effective string living in this M theory circle and time. Uh, you can take finite temperature, so time is also, also a circle. But then you can go to uh, uh, the deep infrared, expect this theory to flow to a CFT, and use the standard techniques to compute the growth of states, and it does reproduce the uh, one of corrected black hole entropy. Okay, standard stuff. Okay, uh, one the point that would be important for us is that in which limit is this a valid description? A couple of uh, inputs go there. For example, we are using rather like these geometry pictures of uh, brains and so on. So uh, also we are using the low energy picture of M theory. But the most crucial assumption we are making, uh, which is relevant for this talk, is that we are, we are going to a regime where gravity is insignificant. This is being done by taking the brains to be far apart. Now, of course, the brains are wrapping, uh, like, so think of the D4 brain, for the M5 brains for a moment. They are in a, uh, a six-dimensional category, I mean, six real. 
So it's a bit like taking two particles on a sphere, two more dimensions. So one way to make gravitational effect negligible is by taking them to be far apart, which you can do only if the space itself is very large. So in particular, you need the Calabria of triple to be much uh, very large. But uh, I should mention that there is a hierarchy of largeness here because end of the day, you are not writing the theory on the Calabria. You are writing the theory on the M-theory circle. So you, you need the M-theory circle to be even larger. So if we go to finite J, that is uh, when the brains are finitely separated, you expect effects of gravity to be important. Now, um, in this regime, so you recall I talked about the black hole partition function and I uh, showed you that it has a very similar form as a CFT entity. Uh, there we did a large J expansion, right? And that simplified expressions a lot. Here we will not do that. We'll do something much simpler. We'll just take the mod of Z, which has this square root form. To go to the CFT, you will uh, simply expand in uh, 1 over J. You will subtract the divergent part, which is the, if you wish, the uh, before brain part. And you'll get this finite energy. Um, one, um, okay, so uh, so the broad picture is that the ground state is a state that carries pure default brain charge. It's not a pure default brain, it's a bounded bound state actually, of uh, D6 and D6 part, but charge wise it's default. And excited states of the CFT are like bound states of D2 and D0 brains on top of it. That's the picture. Uh, one quick check is that if you uh, look at the lowest possible energy in this state. So if you take a pure D4 brain, so to say, uh, it's still still an induced T0 brain charge lingers and you get this uh, finite part. In the CFT side, the relevant sector is the RR sector and you have, uh, well, you have supersymmetry only in one sector. Left and right kind of depends on convention, different uh, works use different conventions, but in one sector, you have supersymmetry, so the ground state energy doesn't know about the central charge there. In the non supersymmetric sector, the ground state energy uh, can, like, gets contribution from that central charge. And you can check that they are exactly the same. Uh, just to make the point that you can read off the CFT spectrum from the information of mass. In, uh, note that we are only uh, commenting on BPS states. Uh, I'll skip this, it's just a detail of uh, mass and field content of the CFT. Okay, uh, let's quickly comment on the modularity. So the partition function I wrote in the, uh, the supergravity context, that had this tau, it came up naturally in the supergravity. It turns out that it's also the natural tau in the, in the CFT, for example, if tau 2 is very simple to uh, understand. Uh, beta is the circumference of the time circle, and LSTS is the uh, circumference of the M theory circle. So tau 2 is the ratio of these two circles. Indeed, uh, falls in that, that particular form. Um, okay. Another part of the story was that the ADS3, uh, supposedly holographic dual to the CFT. This arises as follows. Uh, you can rephrase the limit in which CFT arises in terms of five dimensional quantities. So in terms of 11 dimensional quantities, uh, this limit you can express as keeping R fixed in absolute terms dx to be uh, fixed but large in, in, in eleven dimensional units, and then taking the eleven dimensional length to zero. 
which notes that note that this in particular implies that we are working with uh, strong coupling, which is expected because we were taking the MTR circle to be very large, and we also did the string length to be very small. Uh, regarding the geometry, we start with a asymptotically flat five D geometry, and so it's useful to uh, rephrase things in terms of five dimensional quantities, uh, which can be done as follows. So you uh, define this five dimensional tank, sorry, five dimensional tank length, and you keep R fixed and take this five dimensional tank length to zero. It's same as taking G to be large. This can be seen as follows. Um, so J, J has a, a dimension of length square. So let's define a normalized J to have the uh, scale of like string length square. Then the scale of J is fixed by this uh, lambda. Now the Calabio volume is then it then scales like lambda Q. So lambda is like Vx to the one third. Uh, you can play around these quantities and you can uh, see that this lambda is proportional to this particular combination, which goes to infinity in this particular uh, limit. So we are indeed in large limit when we are talking about CFT2 or equivalently ADS3. And this is called the decoupled limit in this case. We want to move away from it now. Um, yeah, uh, a further subtlety in the story uh, arises due to multicentered black holes because, uh, well, some of them go down to a single ADS3 throat. We expect them to be captured by the CFT. Uh, the ones which do not, um, it's not very really clear if they're captured by the CFT or not. Uh, but anyway, it's. Uh, of the subtlety, I'll skip it. Uh, scaling black holes, they have unfixed distance. So uh, in particular, there are scaling black holes which can come arbitrarily close. Uh, we expect them to be captured by the CFT2. Okay, side comment. Um, yeah. I think I have already mentioned whatever was to be mentioned about holography. The broad picture is that Everything that goes down a single ADS three throat in this decoupling limit is expected to be ex expected to be captured by CFT. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if the status of scaling black holes are completely understood here. Anyway, now coming back to the question that you posed in this uh, work is that what happens if we move away from decoupling limit? What happens in regard with the uh, Field theory description, what happens regarding the geometric side and what happens regarding their co correspondence duality. And the picture we will propose is that uh, this side, it amounts to deforming the CFT by ET bar uh, de 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 deformation. Uh, here we are still understanding it, but it uh, seems like that the boundary is being moved outwards, I'll explain what I mean. Uh, this I don't have much to say about. Any questions, Tina? So turning gravity back on will mean the TT bar definition? That would be your proposal, yes. Okay. So the main um, insight of this work is extremely simple. Uh, it's, you take the z, you take the mod z square, and uh, that is the mass. And so uh, recall that we, to get the CFT energy levels, or uh, the picture was that the ground state is like a state with only G4 brain charge, and to get and the excited states are bound states. But get, to get to the energies, we looked at the black hole mass and subtracted the divergent part, divergent in the limit j go to infinity. We'll do the same. The only thing is that we will not take the J goes to infinity limit. So in, in some sense, we are doing something even simpler. And if you do that, obviously you get this particular expression. And this happens to have the exact form of uh, TT bar deformed, I mean, energy levels of a TT bar deformed CFT. Uh, let me make it more clear. So, this is what we get uh, in 
in TTB deformation literature, the uh, energy levels of uh, TTB deformed CFT uh, they have this particular form. So here, uh, okay, n refers to the nth level, which for us corresponds to the statement about the charge. En r comma zero is the energy levels of the CFT. Uh, here zero corresponds to the fact that it has not been deformed. So mu is the deformation parameter. In the limit, mu goes to zero. You retrieve the CFT energies. Right? Uh, you see the divergent part. This this part diverges. So does this part from the side to the four over four mu squared. They cancel out. And in mu goes to zero limit, you get en r of zero. The CFT energy levels. Uh, the correspondence is pretty clear. The deformation parameter mu is related to the inverse of pj square, which would be the volume of the pore cycle, the before brain. Uh, energy levels are energy levels. Uh, uh, Pn is the momentum, which was kind of expected because the like uh, here it was the default brain charge for the black hole case, which was indeed the momentum. Okay. Uh, are there any questions on this slide? Do you get the opposite sign of the one that would make you go inside the bulk? No. But, uh, you see, we explicitly get positive sign. Don't have any room to play with that. It's opposite from the bulk. Ah, it's the opposite. Yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. Because if you go in the bulk. Yeah. No, no, I don't. Okay, yeah. So it's kind of expected that you will expect it to move outward in some sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, just a quick intro to TT bar. So it's not every day that you have a solvable interacting theory. Uh, TT bar is a re remarkable exception. Um, so based on rather general assumptions, Zamorowski Chikov showed that if you take, uh, I mean, the one parameter family of theories deformed by this particular operator, which is dubbed TT bar, is essentially determinant of T. The stress tensor appropriately defined that is solvable uh, in certain sense. For example, a simplest example would be a free scalar. If you TT bar deform a free scalar, you get an action of this form of TBI type. What is more important for us is that you can actually uh, the yeah the assumptions on which this story is built they are very often to even for excited states, using this fact, Zamalov Chikov could write down uh, how the energy levels change under this deformation. In particular, one has this precise formula that I showed in, in the last to last slide. Um, yeah, this is what we we'll essentially need from the TT bar deformation story, a well known energy formula. Okay. Um, now, the evidence that I have provided till now is limited to the uh, masses of BPS black holes. Of course, uh, the statement is far stronger and it requires more evidence. For example, the story started with black holes. So the first thing you'll ask is that, well, uh, can it explain black hole entropy? So the statement was that the corresponding brain system in finite volume regime is captured by TT bar deformation of MSW CFT. So it's still a microscopic description of the black hole. Uh, can it explain the black hole entropy? Oh, yes, simply because the uh, if you look at the energy formula, you see that the energy level of the uh, of the energy of the nth level depends only on data of the nth level. So the degeneracies are not written. So in fact, n for us amounts to charge. So once you have labeled the charges, the degeneracies are not changing. So just by the fact that MSW safety can explain the entropy of these black holes, so can the TT bar deformation of MSW safety. Um, this is not really a consistency check. The second point, it's rather a cute observation that uh, Cardi shows that you can think of TT bar de deformation to some extent as integrating as a sort of randomized strategy. Uh, it's kind of happening because we still have a field theoretic framework. We still don't have 
that it is a dynamic increase of freedom, which is our story. Uh, so intuitively, we would like to think that it's a vector of integrating red gear out. Uh, supersymmetry. So in the black hole side of the story, supersymmetry doesn't care about J, whether J is infinite or finite, so on. So you still expect the same supersymmetry. Now, uh, MSW CFT have, it has four zero supersymmetry uh, or zero four, uh, I mean, it has supersymmetry, four supercharges in one sector, uh, left moving or right moving. Now, TT by deformation does not change your degeneracy. So there is some chance of it might, that it might preserve supersymmetry, but it's not obvious. Uh, luckily, for low, lower supersymmetries, like zero one, 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 zero two, 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 uh, for these, uh, people have shown that there exist like cousins of TT by deformation, if you wish, which have which preserved supersymmetry off shell, and they have the same effect on energy levels as TT bar. Uh, of course, we have zero four, but uh, if we just forget about higher supersymmetry for a moment, it looks like that supersymmetric cousins of TT bars they can do the job. Uh, regarding having more supersymmetry, um, well, one thing you can, of course, do is that express this uh, zero four theory in terms of, let's say, zero one, and think of this extra and so extra so four R symmetry. Now, since TT bar deformation that doesn't spoil degeneracies, I expect its R symmetry to go through at least on shell. So we expect uh, the supersymmetry to go through at least on shell. We feel there's a very good chance that it might go optional, but it might hold optional, optional as well. But it's a bit difficult to check because the um, like, um, like optional realization of zero four supersymmetry, uh, I think, is a bit more tricky than the lower ones. Okay. Another very non trivial condition would be modularity. Now, in CFT, it's very obvious, but the point is that. If you are in supergravity, so the story started with black holes in type 2a, you can dualize along time circle to go to type 2b, and then you have a SL 2z symmetry, uh, which is which appears as modularity in the CFT. Now, this SL 2z in supergravity, it doesn't care about how large your J is. So even for finite J, that symmetry should be there. Uh, for us, this means that the TT bar deform theory should continue to preserve modularity. Now, for <clears throat> uh, just from the data of the energy spectrum, uh, for partition functions, it has been shown that if your starting partition function preserves mo modularity, so does its TT bar deformation. Uh, in all fairness, um, things are a bit tricky here because the quantity we're really interested in is elliptic genus. And there it has a modular weight even to start with. And such quantities do not continue to have the same modular weight under TT bar deformation. Uh, I mean, it's not clear even if they have nice modular properties. So I think there is more to be understood in this particular form. Sorry, Adam. Sorry. That's a paper that's kind of TT bar deformed. Yeah, but. Uh, I'm not sure if that solves this problem. Why does elliptic, I thought elliptic genus really doesn't have a weight, but an index. I think it is three by two comma zero, something like that. Well, if I take the elliptic genus of the K3 sigma model, it doesn't have any weight. Uh, I don't know, but in this particular case, I think it has some weight. I think it might be different by whether you include some eta. Invariance. So the factors of the eta function in the denominator, but no one wants it. So some people define the order genus to be the numerator, and then that's the way what the partition function does. Is. I think that's what we is. I see. Uh, words, he's considering the partition function trace minus one to the f times q to the h or q to the h. <clears throat> I'm very forgetful, but I think it's true that that doesn't have a weight. But it's what sometimes people call the elliptic genus divided by the power of the A function. 
I mean, both separately have one. Generalized index trace f squared minus one to the f. Oh, okay. the f squared. Yes. Yeah, 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 I was talking about that. that. So this, this isn't the opportunity. No, not on the post. I guess this is it's a four. four. Oh, I when I said this, you I was thinking about my supersymmetry. I think well, uh, but, but in principle, for zero point four, you can have non vanishing things like K three. But it means if you need to insert an F squared, it means that there is some some zero modes. That yeah, there are good things if you need to yeah. them up. So the guy with the square insertion does avoid the uh, the figure. Yeah. <laughs> okay, if you insert F squared, then yeah. But is that what we have to do here? Like all I don't remember what the spectrum is here. Do we need to get something interesting? Do we need the F squared? I think that that will give the black hole entropy. I mean, the degeneracy that we were looking for because the naive index will vanish due to its diversity. So you compute it participants in RR sector, which would be the index in the actual thing, and uh, that would vanish due to it. And this is a curious uh, side comment, really. So, um, in n equals to two supergravity, you have multi centered black holes. So, even the ground state of the CFT, which carries only D4 brain charge, it's not a single D4 brain drain, but the bound state of D6, D6 part states. In fact, uh, much of the low lying states are bound states. And as you uh, lower J, this killer modulus, as you move in the modulus space, at some point, they can decay. Now, um, if you are in CFT, of course, you are working in a limit in a particular uh, in very large J. There's no way you can pose this question. But now that we are giving a proposal that if you lower J such and such happens, uh, we can pose that question here. But what happens to these states? Uh, in the gravity picture, we know that they decay. Uh, here, there is a corresponding pathology, if you wish. Um, in fact, um, a very nice correspondence. So the TT bar energy, uh, deformed energy levels look like this. Now, just recall that if you have a CFT, uh, for example, the ground state energy would always be negative minus C over something. Uh, in fact, there will be much low lying states, which are which all have negative energies. So you can imagine that for a regime of mu, uh, the thing inside the square root, it might have negative values. Correspondingly, the energy might have imaginary values. These are, these are presumably signs of instability. So uh, to be more concrete, if you take mu to be very large, then the first term that dies down, uh, the second term might be more important, and if the energy is negative, you might expect some problem. Uh, the boundary of this uh, pathology and nicety is where the thing inside the square root vanishes. And see, this has a very clear meaning in the black hole side. This was nothing but the black hole mass. So this tells you that the, like this boundary of this pathology is where the BPS masses vanish. Um, and uh, this, this is exactly known to happen, known to occur when uh, you have polar states, that is uh, this particular combination to be negative. And it is known that for these states, uh, the corresponding bound states actually decay before hitting this particular wall. Uh, so uh, there is a, 
somehow to one to one correspondence between pathologies in well, not pathologies. Uh, how to say like uh, instabilities of states in this TT bar pictures and what you already know from that we bound states. Um, I should mention that where exactly this decay happens, uh, that cannot quite be read out from the TT bar. At least uh, we cannot as of yet. Uh, here is a prediction of our proposal. So uh, the TT bar deformed energy levels have a square root. So uh, if you if you, if you hold J fixed, that is, if you hold the deformation parameter fixed and then take energy to be very large, then asymptotically the like the deformed energies scale like square root of undeformed energies. Or if the middle term is very high, E is very high, you get this. Um, <clears throat> now, in the CFT regime, we already know that CFT is the case of the uh, 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 undeformed theory. There we know that the degeneracy grows like e to the log square root E. So if you just replace this, this tells you that the growth of the deformed theory is exponential of energy, which is hadron growth. So you expect a phase transition at some temperature. If you just put various constant, you'll see that it scales like mod j. Mod j. Um, so in particular, note that for the CFT, in this picture, j corresponds to infinity. So this temperature, you, you never reach this temperature. There is no Hadron transition. Uh, so the prediction of our proposal is that if you have a uh, M5 ring wrapped in a finite four, four cycle, uh, there should be a Hadron transition. Uh, we do not know of any existing uh, evidence or counter evidence for this. Okay, now comes the geometry, the moving outward part. Any questions? Just to remind you that how the ADS3 emerged. So the picture was this, that we had asymptotically flat uh, 5D uh, black string geometries. And then we took a certain limit called decoupling, decoupling limit. It's not exactly near horizon limit in the sense that um, it's not just coordinate transformation. We are actually playing with uh, the 5D plan. Anyway, that region effectively has the lift of zooming in near the horizon and one gets an ADS3. Uh, more concretely, you write down the 5D metric, uh, which, uh, which uh, in general is somewhat uh, complicated expression. But then if you, uh, so L5 appears there, the 5D Planck length. If you hold R fixed and take L5 to zero, the computation simplifies a lot. You also do some uh, rescaling of coordinates uh, such that entities that are uh, apart whose di distance is of order L5 cube, they kind of survive in this limit. Those who are further do not survive. In that limit, you can get this metric, which is that of a rotating BTZ. Um, yeah, this is the ADS3 story for a single center black hole. Now, the question is that if you do not take this limit, what happens? Um, intuitively, first, before we write down the metric, intuitively, you expect this to have the effect of zooming out. So you expect to see a bit of flat space perhaps, or the ADS boundary to move outward, so to say. Uh, more concretely, what you get is this. So um, the computations are a bit complicated and unfortunately we could, as of now, we could uh, do it only for this particular case where the B field is said to be equal to Q. So it depends on the, uh, electric charge, and we take the killer mo mo modulus to be proportional to, to be uh, yeah proportional to the magnetic charge, and only the, the proportionality constant. Um, in this particular case, we could solve the metric, and it's given by this the bluish part. So note that it's very simple. So only change is in the bluish part. Uh, this part was not there before in the last slide. So 
uh, this part was has been multiplied by this part and this part has been multiplied by this part. A uh, couple of things to note. One is that, uh, of course, if you say 10, 5 equals to 0, you get back uh, what you had before. That's consistency check. Uh, then, uh, if you set this row equals to row star, uh, that is where BTC singularity uh, was. In that regime, the effect of L5 vanishes. So this is to say that if you move uh, deep interior, uh, you do not see the effect of TT bar deformation, which is uh, in line with the expectation that um, TT bar deformation is an irrelevant deformation. So if you uh, moving deep in the bulk is expected to be the effect of to be equivalent to like moving in deep in prayer. And we do not expect uh, irrelevant deformation to do much there. That's exactly what you get. You do expect an irrelevant deformation to change a lot the UP. That is the asymptotics. And this is also what you get. So if you take rho to be very large, infinity, obviously the asymptotic changes. In fact, uh, it changes to that of the flat space. Uh, um, so, like, so in this sense, the boundary moves uh, uh, outward, but uh, not really outward by a little amount, but, but very significantly in the sense that the asymptotic changes. Uh, we can't treat it perturbatively. So sudden big change. Any questions? Okay, uh, let me then sum up. So we have provided some evidence that uh, if you consider the four grain black holes, then in the uh, finite volume regime, that is for finite scalar modulus, they are captured by the TT bar deformation of the MSW CFT. Uh, correspondingly, it seems uh, the ADS side of the story, the asymptotic seems to change. <clears throat> it's not immediately clear I mean, how much this correspondence holds or not. But if it does, then it might it might be interesting because it might tell us something about flat space holography because the asymptotics now is flat space, no more ADS3. But unfortunately, we don't have much to say about that right now. Um, I'll just uh, end up with uh, broad questions. So of course, the obviously desirable thing would be a first principle derivation of our proposal. Um, the following might be useful in this context. So uh, it has been shown that if you couple uh, CFT to a basic gravity in a certain flat space limit, then that gives rise to the spectrum of TT bar deformed CFT. So now we wonder that in this regime, could it be that somehow there is a JT gravity emerging in the MSW uh, thing world sheet? Uh, just thinking about that. Uh, if you have any suggestion, please uh, tell us. Uh, our evidences have been limited to BPS black holes. But uh, if it is true, then the mass of non-BPS black holes uh, should also follow a similar uh, pattern. We are yet to check that. Um, we need a better understanding of wall crossing. Wall crossing. Um, then the uh, central chart that, that we used is a tree level one. There are, of course, co uh, corrections to it. And uh, in this story, then there are corresponding correct, uh, corrections to the TT bar deformation itself. It's not obvious how to think of those and so on. Um, then, is this story limited to before brain black holes in N, N equals to two theory? Or is it more general? That's not immediately clear. Um, yeah, largely, uh, lastly, it would be interesting to understand the bulk duel. That's all. Thank you. So TT bar deformation is always implied that it's the double trace deformation. Right? Ah. Uh, here, that would be the natural thing. Uh, I should first mention that I think the distinction between double and single trace is really well defined when you have something to trace over, like in orbital CFTs and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not the case here. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if there is a very clear difference, but in the sense that the natural general, generalization would be the double trace, 
In that sense, I think double trace would be more natural to be. Well, you can consider double trace to mean that your operator is the product of two single trace operators, where T is a single trace operator. For the, the structure of the large element is that there's there are operators that have the scaling properties of single trace operators when you do have a trace. But it's not clear how you would define a single trace T bar operator. The double trace, the yes. yes. This clearly ties back to the double trace operator. <laughs> the double trace operator, there's a general construction due to some algebra, which when you do have a holographic setup and the discussion makes sense, corresponds to the double trace operator. My, my question was getting at uh, Sunny's and Kivian Kutasov's proposal about the single trace deformation of the symmetric product OB fold that is due to a particular deformed. Well, Sunny can say more about it probably. Uh, I don't think it's relevant for that. Okay. This is definitely a double trace. Do you have an interpretation of why you didn't have to turn on other deformations? This in the case of ABS3, the uh, Kerman's paper did talk about it as a and for mostly probably pure gravity because uh, uh, basically we have other operators, but a pure tool in principle. It's, it's surprising that it's enough. I'm not talking much about that. Yeah. It's also similar proposal in ABS5 by Rastelli and some other collaborators. They add some F to the fourth term to the action, which is the analog of TT bar in that situation. Mm -hmm. That is supposed to. Actually, go away from the near horizon limit. Three points. Okay, right now. I look at it. This is very old idea. Never mind. Don't start. Yeah, yeah. In my yeah, they did some explicit check. Right. There are no further questions. Let's uh, thank the speaker again.